Hello, everyone. It's Friday, September 2nd. We have a lot to talk about today on the final bar. The major averages pushing to the downside. The NASDAQ finishing the week in a position of weakness down 1.4%. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for our show as we use the power of technical analysis to better understand what is happening in these markets. And I will tell you, if there is a time in your investment life when you need technical analysis, you need the ability of charts to help you manage risk, to clearly define risk versus reward, and focus on managing uh, that downside protection and, and locking in gains when you can. This is the time, a choppy week among many. And some of my conversations earlier this week dealt with that choppiness and how to think about it. Today's a perfect example, opening strong, finishing weak. We'll look at the evidence over time and see what it can tell us about the overall market environment. Now we have great guests on the show. I had a lot of fun this week with people like Mike Shell and Miss Schneider and others. Monday will be off for the market holiday uh, and happy Labor Day. Hope you have a great uh, long weekend. We will be back with guests. I will be back live on Tuesday. We'll have our first guest on Wednesday, the 7th, John Kosar from Asbury Research. Then on Thursday, the 8th, Kima Reddy joining us from the first time. The week after, on Tuesday, the 13th, Dave Landry will be joining us. Should be a lot, a lot of fun. Let's continue on today's show with our, oh, actually, by the way, we have ChartCon coming up. I almost forgot. ChartCon is going to be fantastic. We spent a lot of time this week uh, talking as a production team, talking with some of our contributors about how we we're going to be approaching different sessions. We are planning a two-day fantastic virtual event. It's October 7th and 8th. I was just chatting earlier today with Linda Rashke about her keynote presentation, talking to her about some of the charts she's going to be using. You're not going to want to miss hearing from people like Linda, like Larry Williams, coming to you from our offices in Redmond. Go to stockcharts.com slash chartcon to sign up for that event. By the way, members get a deeply discounted price as a thank you for being a member. If you have ever considered being a Stock Charts member, now is the time. Join as a free trial. You can experience all the member benefits for a short time, including a discounted uh, rate for the uh, chartcon event. Stockcharts.com slash chartcon to sign up for that event. Let's continue on today's show with our wrap the week segment. So Friday, we like to look back at the last five trading days see what's happened and what sense we can make of it. But I do want to start with the poll. We always have a poll going on our live stream page at stockcharts.com, also our social media accounts. So make sure you follow us on Twitter and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. We asked you which asset class performs best over the next three months. Give you four choices, S&P, uh, the TLT, which is a bond ETF, gold, or the US dollar. Half of you, 48% said the S&P 500, which is really interesting given the weakness that we're seeing right now. But what that tells me, and that's why I asked about a three-month time frame, because that means we've got some room to go even much lower, but then three months down the road, ideally we're past that period. Wouldn't that be nice? And we're talking about uh, renewed strength into year-end seasonally. If three months from now, we're at the beginning of December, that's really the seasonally strongest part of the year usually in most years, you're actually setting up for a uh, a Santa Claus rally of sorts, some sort of rally into year end. The dollar number two, though, I don't know if I would have to guess, I'd probably say the dollar, probably say USD. And, and again, I think stocks will probably seasonally be strong. The question is, how much strength are we going to see there? And, and I think the strength in the dollar is what has defined much of 2022, probably will define the rest of that as well. I'm always interested to see what got the least votes, gold at 12%. That's a hard pitch right now to be to be to be going for gold after it's so beaten down. But as a contrarian play, if you want to fight the masses and buy the GLD, more power to you. Good luck. We'll see what happens. Uh, continuing on our wrap the week segment, let's just check in very quickly on what happened today. We'll look at the last five training days. Think about the uh, the week that has uh, that has played out. Then we'll finish looking at the mindful investor live chart list, breaking down some of the key charts that tell the story here. So first off, the S&P, the NASDAQ finishing weaker today. Today was an interesting day. Earlier in the day, you see the S&P and the NASDAQ pushing higher. The NASDAQ getting very close. The NASDAQ composite, that is, to that 12,000 level. 
where we've we've, uh, we've remained below for quite some time. Rolling over though, right? And breaking back below uh, yesterday's close, just reversing right around lunchtime to finish in a position of weakness. Bit of a bounce in the last 10, 15 minutes, but the damage was really done. So then as I composite down one and a third percent, the VIX bouncing a little bit to the upside, but not too much. Mid caps, small caps, all uh, in the red. So if you're looking for a strong finish to the week, which is what it almost felt like right after the open, it felt like, wow, this could be that big reversal day not to be had. And what this tells you, again, think about the short-term sentiment, buying power, the buying that allowed the markets to go higher was repelled, which means people are really happy selling on some short-term strength or reinitiating shorts. And the 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 weight of the evidence still remains fairly negative. That's what's happening on a day like today. Interest rates are actually pulling back a little bit. So it was an interesting day where um, the market's lower, growth stocks lower, but it wasn't higher rates that really caused this uh, issue in particular because rates were actually down as well. Bond prices moved higher, 10-year uh, yield just below 3.2%. The dollar index, really no change uh, from uh, from Thursday's close. Mixed results uh, also in the commodity space, although overall a little more green than red with the commodity ETF, the DBC up about 0.7%, gold and silver both up about 1%. Finally, cryptocurrencies, a lot of red here with Bitcoin uh, down uh, back below 20,000. We've been revolving around that 20,000 level now uh, for quite some time. And I think that that can happen for longer than you expect. Again, it's funny with charts and with any investment uh, you know, thesis, it's rarely popular to say, uh, you know, it's neutral or it's sideways. You know, you're always trying to think, am I bullish or bearish? Is it positive or negative? You have to remember that in the investing world, uh, you know, a lot of times the direction is that third direction of sideways. Um, and uh, and that, that's sort of what's happening with cryptocurrencies. They're chopping around. There's no real, um, you know, uh, strength on one side versus the other. It's really a market in equilibrium, which tells you to focus a lot on when that uh, equilibrium is broken and either buyers or sellers have taken control. The fact that we keep rotating around that uh, that same level tells me it hasn't happened yet. Just briefly on the sector basis, we're back to that theme we've seen a lot in recent weeks where it's kind of energy working and then everything else in the red. It's kind of what happened today, although materials were uh, just narrowly in the, uh, in the red today. The bottom of the list, communication services, real estate, healthcare, tech, all down a uh, pretty decent amount with the XLC leading uh, the uh, ETFs, uh, the sector ETFs to the downside. Let's look at our wrap of the week chart. So this is just a weekly uh, performance chart starting the clock last Friday's close, looking to where we're at today. If you follow the mouse, uh, my mouse and my voice, you'll follow uh, what's happening on this chart. In black, we have the S&P 500, another painful week for the S&P down 3.2%. That's not great. And, and as of yesterday, it wasn't, uh, it was still uh, down for the week. A lot of just a steady decline uh, through most of the week. Thursday's bounce was sort of a, an aberration among down days here. Number of things underperformed the SP this week. In purple, we have the NASDAQ, or in pink, we have the NASDAQ 100 uh, down about 4%. In purple, it's a small cap ETF, IWM down 4.7%. If you missed my conversation with Ms. Schneider on Wednesday, we talked in particular about the IWM and why that was such an important chart to watch to see if it was able to uh, to hold support and looking at the 50-day moving average, not getting that feeling as the week progressed, every day finishing lower, even though uh, a couple of things sort of finished higher uh, at points during the, uh, the week. Uh, it was sort of down and to the right for small caps. At the bottom, you have the uh, crude oil ETF, this is the USO, which was down about 5.8%. Everything else outperformed the S&P through the course of this week. EM was right about in line, about 3.1% down. In red, we have uh, bond prices using the TLT. That was down 2.8%. Gold and also Bitcoin were about the same, which is 1.6, 1.7%. The only thing in the green this week is the dollar bullish ETF, uh, UUP, which is up 0.9%. This is we're back to one of those uh, patterns where sort of the dollar's working and everything else is not. If you look at the last five trading days, that's what's been happening: strong dollar, weaker everything else. That's been the story for uh, you know. To be honest, a lot of 2022 has had this look. We got away from that mid June to mid uh, mid August, where that sort of flipped around. All of a sudden, you saw other things, growth stocks in particular, uh, you know, rallying in that short term strength. We're back now to that familiar bear market configuration that we've uh, that we've experienced. For much of this year. To finish off our weekly wrap segment, let's go to the Mindful Investor live chart list. As a reminder, this is a list of charts that I keep updated on the Stock Charts platform. You can go to my blog called Mind, uh, The Mindful Investor. Click on the Articles tab to get there. There's a gray button at the top of my blog uh, to access this live list of charts. 
So really interesting. And I, I will have to look at the the tape to get a, uh, we'll have to get it's a photo finish here on my market trend model, but it finished literally to three decimal points right at zero, which uh, has not happened often. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if that's ever happened. And I've been following this for quite some time. Um, literally what happened is my long-term model is bearish. My short-term model is bearish, has been for the last two weeks. My, my medium-term model has been bullish for the last four weeks. Today, earlier in the day, it was uh, it was negative, and this was in the afternoon after the market sold off, and then that rally right into the close kind of put it. What that tells you is the five and thirteen week exponential moving averages have an identical uh, value, and that's possible. That's certainly theoretical possible. It's just highly unlikely. So I'm going to call that a negative because the trend. I would say. I mean, I guess given a neutral, I have the I have the uh, the deciding vote. I vote negative on that one, so which means I will call it. A bearish top, but it's really, really close. So if that's the case, that means long-term, medium-term, short-term market trend models for me are all bearish. That has not happened for a little while. Actually, the last time that was in uh, in play was back here sort of in June, uh, going into that bottom. And even uh, late June, after the bounce, we still remained in a negative configuration here. Um, that's how we spent a lot of uh, um, the, uh, the spring months were like that after our long-term model turned negative. So we're back to a bearish configuration by my read on our market trend model. Another thing to sort of cause some caution is the fact that the RSI, the daily RSI for the S&P 500 has gone below 40. And we talked about how in a bullish range, in a bullish phase in the market, the whole range of the RSI tends to push higher. Um, you can credit people like Connie Brown and, um, ooh, who else am I thinking about? Andrew Cardwell, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year, really did a great job of popularizing that idea, that range bound or that range uh, mentality for uh, for uh, momentum indicators like RSI and others, um, so getting below forty, I think, is a is a dangerous sign for uh, for the S and P. Now, worth noting, we've bounced right to key support at thirty nine hundred. The way you get to a thirty nine hundred uh, level of support here, the way I would do it, is taking the low from mid June, taking the high from mid August when we tested the two hundred day and failed. We then take the Fibonacci retracements between those levels. That's why breaking below 4060 was meaningful uh, by my read, because that tells you we're breaking below that first Fibonacci support. That's that's always the first one that would go. And that tells you we're most likely going to get to the next Fibonacci retracement level around the 61.8% point. That's a 3,900. We hit there on an intraday basis on Thursday, got near there today, but actually didn't touch that level. Going into next week, that is the level I would watch because if we break that, from a Fibonacci perspective, that would suggest a retrace back to the June lows and retesting the low around 36, 36. The other level I would pay attention to is this 38.2% retracement level using March 2020, January 2022. That's more of a longer term um, Fibonacci level taking the last couple of years into consideration. That's where we bottomed out in May. The question is, do we bottom out at a similar point going forward? Folks, we need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my next segment. Power up. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the uh, the trends in the markets using the power of the Stock Charts platform, using the technical toolkit to identify entry and exit points, to think about risk versus reward, and think about potential next steps for these markets. We have a lot more charts to review in the course of today's show, but a couple, couple quick announcements before we get there. First off, we're going to do a mailbag segment a little in a few moments. And we'd love to feature one of your questions in our next mailbag, which will be, I think, Tuesday of next week. We'll have to see when we can fit it into the calendar. You can get your questions to us via email. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email address. We're also on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we're on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the Stock Charts YouTube channel. Just put a comment below the video you're watching. We review those regularly, and I can grab one of those and share them in the show if we need. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's our on-demand platform. It is fantastic. There's so much great content every trading day. A lot of expert uh, suggestions and observations and guidance and education to help you make sense of these markets. Go to StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device, just search for StockCharts TV on demand. 
Let's continue on today's show with our next segment, Power Up. What we like to do is upgrade your use of technical analysis and the stock charts platform. We're going to talk about gallery view. I was talking with our founder, Chip Anderson, earlier today uh, or earlier this week about gallery view and how we could evolve that over time. And uh, just as a quick hint, coming up soon, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later, we're, we're actively developing our next version of Sharp Charts. Now, don't be afraid. It's going to look and and, uh, and and appear just as beautiful as it always have, but we're just going to make it a much more interactive, dynamic experience and way upgrade the capabilities because we're redesigning our Sharp Charts core platform from scratch. It is going to be really, really cool. I'm so excited to be able to share some of these things. Once they're ready to go, we've been, we've been mocking them up and our developers have been big, uh, building them. But one of the things that allows us to do is improve our gallery view. I'll show you what this means. If you bring up what's called gallery view, so switch it from sharp charts, bring up a stock like Home Depot, this will bring up a group of four charts. Now, if you use our stock charts ACP platform, you could replicate this sort of, uh, sort of option by putting four charts on your desktop, easy to do. Within the sharp charts world, you have to use what's called gallery view. This will give you an intraday chart, a daily chart, a weekly chart, and then a point and figure chart. And you can see that they're all bringing up the same stock and it's just showing me a couple different timeframes, allowing me to incorporate the point and figure chart into my thinking. The idea is by looking at different charts on the same uh, stock or the same ETF, you can get the short term to the long term. You can think about the trends and the relationships, identify key levels and how they're related. One of my guests earlier this week, Joe Rabel, literally wrote the book, wrote a book on multiple timeframes. And I was talking with him uh, after he appeared on the show and uh, remembering about uh, his uh, beautifully done book on that on that topic. Gallery view is one of the ways I think you can use um, on stock charts to help understand the relationships of different timeframes. Now, here's the real important thing. Two things I would tell you to do that you can really use to power up your use of this uh, of this feature. Number one, remember, as a stock charts member, you have the ability to customize these charts. So your gallery view could look dramatically different from mine because I have handpicked the four charts that I want to use in my gallery view. Just click on that little button or that little link that says learn how above uh, the charts in your gallery view in your login. And it'll show you how you can use our chart styles to customize each one of these. Because I'm, I'm using the daily and weekly charts that I find meaningful. You may have totally different ones that you want to use. This is the really cool feature. If you put a second ticker, so put the first ticker, comma, the second ticker, you can actually look at the uh, gallery view side by side. If you are A being two stocks, two ETFs, you're not sure whether to buy stock A or stock B. This is a beautiful way to compare and contrast on an apples to apples basis, two different securities you're looking at. Look from top to bottom, from short term to long term and see if you can make sense of the differences there. In this case, you know how would I make sense of these? Home Depot and Lowe's look very similar right now. So I don't know if you could really differentiate the two, but I can really only make that assessment well by looking at the gallery view and comparing them. You'll find with different stocks in different sectors, it's very easy to get have the blinders on and just focus on one particular stock. Use this multiple uh, stock gallery view to compare two different symbols. A lot of times it'll help you really understand where there might be a better opportunity than one of the names you're selecting. That is our Power Up segment focusing on the gallery view feature on stockcharts.com. Let's continue on today's show with our mailbag. As a reminder, our email is always open the final bar at stockcharts.com. And let's get to question number one. Dave, on your AAII chart, what is the setting of the exclamation point AAII bull indicator to show the green columns on top, the red columns under it on the same panel? I tend to get a lot of questions on customizing some of the charts that we uh, that we have on the show. And all I will tell you, the short answer I will tell you is if you ever see me show a chart ever on the show and you think, I want to recreate that and I'm having trouble doing it, just email me at the final bar at stockcharts.com. We can actually send you the permalink so you can save that exact chart into your log and then you'll see exactly how I did it. But just so you know, you're asking about this one where you have the green and the red uh, histograms. Here you're looking at the spread between bulls and bears. This is a trick that Arthur Hill showed me years ago when I was just learning the stock charts platform. He knows it, I think, to this day way better than I do, but I learned a ton from asking him some of these things. And he had some charts that used that, um, that, used that particular uh, technique. The way I did it is in the indicator section, there's this one that's called price up, down, pair. You enter the first ticker column, the second ticker. It can be anything. So I'm doing it using survey data because you have a bullish and a bearish reading. So it's a really good way to show that. Uh, but this is the way that you would actually do it. And you can do it with any symbols. To do the spread, to do the difference between the two, I use the price indicator and then just do ticker number one minus sign the ticker number two. Again, you can use that with any tickers we have on the stock charts platform. It's a great way to show something like this in a uh, in a visually meaningful way. 
Next question. It looks like the QID is forming a right shoulder. And do leveraged ETFs follow the same technical patterns or do they do it differently? Let's look at this one. I don't know if, if you guys are not familiar with uh, QID. That's the ultra short um, uh, QQQ uh, ETF. Reminds me of like SQQQ, which is a uh, an ultra pro short. I think that's a double or triple exposure. These are all the, I think this one is the double short QID. I think SQQQ is the triple short um, uh, uh, QQ's uh, um, ETF. If I remember right, I think that's that's probably right. So the QID is a double short ETF. And the question is, I'm seeing a right shoulder form. Is that uh, is that possible? So the answer is absolutely. That's definitely possible. Here's what you have to remember, though. The way that patterns work like this, we are very good at finding patterns which may or may not actually be there. And there's a book called How We Know What Isn't So, uh, which, uh, and I forget the author and apologize for that. I, that, was, that was one of the first books I read related to behavioral investing and behavioral finance basically talks about how we are hardwired to see patterns as humans. And unfortunately, we, we often see patterns that aren't really there. We detect patterns in data that aren't probably statistically uh, speaking uh, patterns. And I think that is something that uh, plagues us as technical analysts. It's a known weakness. And that's why you have to clearly define entry and exit points and have clear rules as to when you would initiate positions. So if this is a head and shoulders top, which it certainly could be, it's all about the neckline, right? So could this be a right shoulder that then comes down and breaks the neckline and goes down? Yeah, but that is a big could. That is a capital C on the could there uh, because it could just continue to go higher, right? Breaks above 28, then this looks nothing like a head and shoulders top. So it is a potential head and shoulders pattern. The way you would validate that it is, is we would have to roll over and then we would break the neckline. And the neckline is the trigger. So remember with any technical pattern, it's the formation of the pattern that's the beginning, but the trigger is really important because a lot of times you'll never break the neckline and then it's never a confirmed sell signal. We have a great chart school article and, and a number of them on patterns like head and shoulders. So just use the magnifying glass. If you didn't follow everything that I said, click the magnifying glass, search for a term like head and shoulders or triangle, and you'll get a lot of great um, uh, insights on how to think about how to apply those patterns in uh, in your trading. In answer to the, the, the other part of your question, do leverage ETFs follow the same technicals? I, I would argue that they probably do. The problem though with leverage ETFs is if you look at the dynamics of them, because of the way they're calculated and they're trying to magnify daily returns, the movements aren't as, they aren't the same as you would on the underlying. So I would probably not look at patterns as much on a leverage ETF. I would look at the underlying side. I would do all my pattern work on this chart, on the cues and, and, and interpret patterns there. The leveraged ETFs give the, you are basically the lever you would pull to make a trade based on the pattern you'd see here. Just like you'd use options. I wouldn't analyze an options contract using technical analysis. I would analyze the underlying uh, security and then use options as a way to express my investment thesis using a trading vehicle. So I, you know, while I, I, I was laying out the patterns on the QID, ideally I would, I would assume you probably don't want to do that on the QID or the SQQQ or one of those instruments. I would do it on the underlying security, like the Qs or the spies or whatever you're, you're really getting exposed to, and then use those leverage ETFs to magnify the bet, just like you would use, um, um, a margin uh, account to have a more leveraged exposure. Next question, Larry Tentarelli, uh, who's the founder of Blue Chip Daily and a, a guest on this show, does always does a great job. We should have him back on uh, here soon. He shared a sharp chart with price labels on them. How do I set that? What's the method that the uh, that stock charts uses to select those price highs and lows? That's a really good question. I'll stick with the chart of the cues here, um, but um, I will add this indicator. And just below the price, you see this section where it calls chart attributes. You have this thing called price labels within ACP. You have this similar feature, it's just in a different place. Uh, but on sharp charts, this is how you would do it. When you click update, you'll find all these price labels that automatically pop up here. It's a great way, but a lot of I, I a lot of, I've seen a lot of people use those. Larry often uses them in the charts that he publishes on on social media and in his research. I don't blame him because it's pretty helpful to just quickly identify key swing highs and lows is what it's designed to do. I have often gone with simplicity and, and especially visual simplicity. So I actually take them off my chart. I don't really show them, but it is very much a preference thing. You're welcome to them. How are we calculating them? So it's actually using an indicator called zigzag. So if you go down here to overlays and pick an indicator called zigzag, 
um, you will find that uh, the labels are basically reflecting the zags and the zigs of the zigzag indicator. Sometimes you won't see one of them labeled. That's just because the label can't fit in because of the congestion in the price. So uh, other than that, this is, these are the levels that the um, that the algorithm is using to determine that. What's that? What that is actually doing is it's basically saying every five percent swing in the Nasdaq 100 is a new zig or zag. It's a new trend, and I'm basically tending. Uh, you know, once we get a new uh, turn, I'm able to use the previous extreme and label it. As a uh, as a as a point, so that's what it's basically doing. Once there's a five plus percent move, that becomes a new um, a new node in the zigzag indicator, and that's a new point to uh, to label. If you look at the magnifying glass and search for the key phrase zigzag, you can find more info on uh, on what that means. Final question for the last comment on DIS: Do you expect a retest for DIS alone, the market as a whole, or both of it fails to hold above the recent swing uh, swing highs? Uh, this is the chart that I was showing earlier in the week. I think this is one of my three and three charts. And you asked about this soon after uh, that episode. Uh, and I was basically saying, you know, it's key that that we hold that level. Same as I talked about NVIDIA holding its recent lows. So what I like to do is look at an individual chart like Disney and analyze the chart. And that's why I think that level is so important, around $110. But what I also like to do is think about the broader implications, right? If stocks like Disney are not holding a recent breakout level. What does that tell me about investors broadly uh, and uh, thinking about risk on versus risk off? Because it's the same investors that will be moving the market with all sorts of different tickers. So I like to think about what a breakdown in Disney or NVIDIA or uh, Microsoft or any of those actually means for that stock, but also what can it tell me about the broader risk appetite? If stocks like XYZ are not holding support, what does that tell me about the broader implications? That's probably the, the comment I was making because that's a, a, a an approach that I learned during my Fidelity years. It was very much a bottom-up stock picking process, but you knew a lot about the broader markets just by looking at individual names and what was happening because a lot of times the patterns would emerge on the individual stocks and groups before it would be reflected on the larger indexes. And that's what I would suggest there. Great mailbag, you guys. And thank you so much for those thoughtful questions. As always, keep them coming. And uh, we need to wrap the show. Let's go to the three and three. Here's three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. Weekly S&P 500, we're using the PPO indicator and then the RSI at the bottom. My conversation with Mike Shell yesterday was interesting because I asked him like, when we just were speaking before we went live on the show, like where, you know, just what general sense, where are you at with things? And he just said, bearish. And then he started filling in all the details as to why he could very much justify that bearish phase. One, as I was talking with him a little more, you know, one of the things we talked about was a lot of investors got drawn in by this bounce from mid-June to mid-July. And that's just the far right side of this chart here. From there, we've obviously rolled over again. It certainly feels this week, this week feels a lot like the first half of this year and a lot less like the last couple months, which have been uh, more tactical bullish. This feels more like a bear market phase. And what I was doing after my discussion with Mike was going back to this chart and looking at where we're at right now versus this period, which is sort of mid-2008. Look at the similarities. The uh, PPO was above zero, then dipped below. We had that at the end of 07. We had that uh, sort of April of uh, this year. We then bounced uh, right around the 150-week moving average back up to the 40-week. You can see that, of course, happened uh, just here in the last couple of weeks. From there, we rotated to the downside. This is after the RSI had gone just below 40, but not below 30. Then we bounced up to about an RSI 50 to 60 level, which is where we're at now. Then this came and the next six months were painful. And that's the challenge I have with this market. While I can't guarantee we're going to have a repeat of that, I'm just telling you the scenario we're seeing right now looks a lot like that scenario, which tells me to consider that as a potential option, look for this combination of factors and see if I see a repeat. This week, I'm seeing a lot of similarities to that historical period. Chart number two, Microsoft. Microsoft has broken down through the 50-day moving average about 5 to 6% above its low in June. That means you got a little bit of room for a stock like Microsoft to keep going down, stay above 240 and still hold those lows. So that is possible that we have more room for this down market, but not too much to break down. But what would happen if Microsoft gets below 240? That quits, that's what concerns me about this broader market. Finally, the bullish percent in the NASDAQ 100. I've talked about how that has happened four previous times in 2022. Each one of those times, this indicator then got below 30. That means, again, that we have further downside potential here. We talked about some of the evidence here. What do your charts tell you? Go to StockChartsTV.com, watch all of our previous episodes, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Dave Keller at Stock Charts. Have a great night. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.